Okay. So now, I'll move on and I'll sort of start to give some of the key, the key results, and then my colleagues Rachel Warren and Paul Sayers will then sort of follow me and sort of, between the three of us, will cover the suite of things that we've done uh, in OpenClim. And I'll start with sort of urban risks. And so the picture here is the UK SSP. So we now have these downscaled uh, socioeconomic scenarios which give populations for, for local authority areas for different views of the future. So for SSP3, I mean, if you look at the sort of black plot, those are the national numbers and the devolved administration numbers. The yellow is actually the, UK, the change in the UK population. Um, SSP3, hardly any change at all. SSP5, you've got nearly 50 million more people uh, in the country. Um, then the maps actually show the distribution of those for SSP2 and SSP4 um, for... Uh, for, for, for so we, you can see what, where the population has been allocated. And then we have the problem when we're thinking about risk assessment and adaptation, what does that mean particularly for the built environment? So with the urban development model, we've actually downscaled those population changes and actually translated that into uh, a de the demand for, for, for um, buildings and associated infrastructure so we can look at the effects on risk. And so the, we start off then this, showing Scotland here with the populations from the UK SSPs. And then we look at the issue of the suitability. What, where, what areas are most suitable? And for each SSP, there's a narrative, a storyline about how the priorities of that world. So we've interpreted those um, storylines and actually developed different, uh, different uh, realizations of each SSP to reflect that. So we, we, but we end up with uh, an areas that are suitable or unsuitable, and sort of the and, and the, pa the panel the panel two is sort of showing that suitability uh, uh, score. Moving up for, for one particular SSP, for th moving on into three, then you see the um, new prop the, the growth in urban areas, the red areas um, reflecting that. And again, you can't build on an existing urban area, but you can build around it, or you might potentially build on open space within it as well. That's another, another possibility. And then you need, to, that, that's saying what are the urban areas, and then in step four, we go to the building density. We actually sort of then sort of downscale that at one uh, hectare grids to uh, actual building configurations and building types. And this sort of, again, sort of stepping out, just comparing SSP2 and SSP4, SSP2 is a very constrained future, so you can't, there are many places you cannot build. You can see, you know, it's hard to see the areas in England that you can build, really, except in one or two cases at this scale, but if you zoom in, there are some small areas. SSP4, much more open, much freer. And then if you go to, say, London, which is the, 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 two, the two panels, um, you, you actually um, can look at, you have a demand for population in each uh, London borough, and what this emerges is SSP2, there's very little land available, so if you're gonna put, uh, you have to have very high densities to accommodate um, the people that the SSP scenario is suggesting will be there compared to SSP4. So you get very different sort of outcomes. And then in the urban fabric generator, um, this sort of relationship is taken, which actually takes diff the density here, and um, as, you, as the density increases, so the mix of um, buildings changes, reflecting this, uh, this paper, which sort of, has, 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 has sort of mapped these out. And um, you then actually, for each, each one hectare, you look at the um, buildings, the roads, the green space. So we get a view, a synthetic view of what it would look like for um, impact assessment. If we look at, um, so this is now Newcastle, um, and SSP2, SSP4, and SSP5, that's the one with the very large population growth, and you can, I think you can self-evidently see that very clearly on this slide. We have um, quite large uh, expansions in population. Um, you can see the numbers there, for example, SSP2, about 20% growth in population. In terms of, um, but then when we look at the growth in, because of density considerations, that doesn't necessarily translate into the same growth in the, in, in the number of buildings. And so for SSP2 and SSP5, 
um, the, the building growth is, is, is lower, reflecting that those buildings are, you know, are packing a lot of people into them, shall we say. SSP4, in fact, it's the opposite because it's a more, because you've got a lot more space. So that's just, so that's very important. So we've got this consistent view across the project of the urban form and how it's evolving with time. And so every model is looking at that consistent um, urban form. And I'll now move just to an illustration of city flooding. And it's, again, it's drawing on Newcastle, so it's building on the slides I showed you. Um, and this is the CityCat model, and it's showing an event uh, an extreme event over one hour. So these are basically, you're going around here with sort of 15 uh, minute um, time steps um, over the one hour. And you can, you can watch there how, but this is working at two meter resolution, and you can watch the build up with time of the areas that have been inundated. And of course, we also have the flood depth, and you can then actually see what of the existing built environment and the new built environment uh, is being impacted um, by that event. And if we move on, we can sort of see this is purely with socioeconomic change. So this is, th this is the increase in damages due to new development. So we're assuming the climate in these runs are stationary. Um, and you can see, for, so, and we're looking at SS, SSP 2 and 4 in 2050 and 2080. And um, you can see the effects are in the range of 1 to 6%, depending uh, on, the, um, on, 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 on the scenario uh, that you're looking at. Then, if we introduce, um, so again, the top left panel there is again showing SSP2 with no climate change. If we move across to um, the, the, the furthest panel at the top, 2050, there you see um, with climate change, and so it's a much bigger effect. It's a 29% effect um, increase in uh, damages as a compared to a 4% just due to new build in SSP2. Put them together, it's 34%. And then, of course, I made the point that in OpenClim, we want to think about adaptation. So, um, again, this is an illustration of, what, of, a, of an effect. So, if you then made all the pavements um, change them to a permeable surface, what effect would that have by sort of building regulations over time? And the damages are then going up about 22%. So you're having a significant, you haven't ameliorated all the damages, but that change has had um, a big, a significant effect. Moving on now to a sort of hotter, drier UK, looking really at heat uh, and drought. Um, so heat-related mortality is a sort of, is. A, projected to increase with climate change, but again, that was mentioned by Siraj. And I think as well as climate change, increases in population is quite important, particularly uh, when we go to the 2080s. And you can sort of see the numbers here with two degrees in 2050, two degrees in 2080, and four degrees in, in, in 2080. And there's very large increases, particularly with SSP5, because we have the largest um, increase in population, but it's happening Across, across the piece, and maybe almost um, in under four degrees with the social economics, you're almost getting an order of magnitude effect. With um, although there's no acclimatization um, in these results, so these are these these are just a, these are direct application of results. If we look at the um, what's causing this, the, the, the results here are not looking at particular events; they're looking at the the, the mortality in a season, and here we have a, a graph that shows degree warming above the threshold at which um, mortality starts, and it brings out the point that actually most people are dying in um, events that are only three, four, five degrees above that threshold. And the very extreme events, uh, well, probably the events that get in the press, but they're actually not killing as many people. So that you know, so it's, again, it's it's looking at the integration of, of, of the effect. Maps are very important, so we can actually start to look at these results in uh, a spatially explicit way. 
and not surprisingly, the, result, the, the issues are greatest in southern uh, and, and, and central England. But you can see that with time, there's a sort of a northerly movement. And so you start to see problems, for example, emerging in the central belt of Scotland with mortality happening there. And the numbers, you know, still overwhelmingly, most people are the biggest problems in England, but you can see that in Wales, uh, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, uh, with, with four degrees, there, there are significant I increases in, de in deaths. And then adaptation for heat-related mortality. I think this is a really important question for CCRA4, really, about how, how do people acclimatize to heat? Because I think they do, but to what extent will these be offset? And this is just showing the effects of, um, of essentially arbitrary changes. So you, people can tolerate a one degree or a two degree uh, rise in temperature. So, you know, wh what that might mean, whether that's physiological change or they buy air conditioners, it's not explicit. It's, so it's just, but illustrating that we can look at these, and I think this is really important because it will mean that the impacts uh, are, 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 are less. And, and how much will happen autonomously, and then how much will, can we uh, affect by policy? And then in terms of heat and labor productivity, um, we can look at the, uh, look at the effects of, um, of this as well. And with, with acclimatization, um, taking, a, take, taking acclimatization into effect, it's really a problem that emerges after four degrees of warming. Um, and again, you can see that we're, it's a problem in really mainly uh, in, in England. So it's, it's, fall, it's, it's, it's following the patterns that we've seen in the other um, slides. If we didn't get acclimatization, then we would get um, more, um, we would get bigger impacts. Moving on quickly now, so in terms of drought, um, I think the numbers, basically we have two models in drought. We're, we're looking at SHETRAN and HPV, so we're actually comparing models, so you have two results. And they're showing a very similar pattern that as we get rising temperature, so we get uh, an increase in, the, in, in, in severe droughts. Um, in a number of severe droughts, there, there, are, there are differences between the models. And we can see the spatial pattern. Um, and so everywhere is getting worse, really. Um, if we look at the duration of droughts, um, again, the two models, uh, there is an increase in duration. It's, it's, it's stronger in the Shetran model over HBV. Uh, and we can see in the, in the sort of east and the south, there seem to be um, more longer droughts. Although, you know, different catchments differ. And you can note some of the catchments in the, high, in the top of Scotland are showing um, significant changes. And lastly, um, meteorological drought. Um, and again, this is um, this both in terms of number per year and the duration, um, two to four degrees. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's getting significantly increase, increasing over the country. And my last slide now, water supply. So one of the benefits, in OpenClim, we're talking about linking some models together, and we're talking about using Daphne, and the RU model, um, the water resources, the, the environment Ages water resources model for England and Wales, um, has, is, is used fundamentally for looking at water supply issues, but in OpenClim, it's a physics-based model, so in OpenClim, we're asking new questions of that. This is work that's ongoing, but looking at the 2040s and 2070s, looking at different types of environmental ambition, different levels of adaptation, and really beginning to make that model, I think, uh, available to CCRA for in a way that it, it isn't learning how it can be used for those types of assessments. So with that, then, I'll stop, and I'll pass over to Rachel Warren, who'll take you further forward with open climate.